Hi, my name is Katina Michael. I'm from Arizona State University. I'm from the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and I also have a joint appointment in the School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. And I'm coming to you on pre-record from a place called Tathra, New South Wales in Australia. And you can see this amazing backdrop for this talk that I'm giving on critical AI. And it's all purposeful. I'm here surrounded by rocks and the natural backdrop being the beach. And there's a reason for this. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we've got to contrast that with the natural surroundings we have around us. And this is what nature is about, right? It's about this amazing harmony in the ecosystems. It's about biodiversity. It's about multiple things. And as we seek to automate, we can't forget where our feet are actually planted on the ground. And so we exist somewhere, right? We have a location and often we hear a welcome to country. In this country, it's the Yuan clan, the Aboriginal people. And we remember them and respect elders past and present and acknowledge the custodians of the traditional land. But on this traditional land of the Yuan people, we can already see in the backdrop a few built up things. And that's got to do with change. It's got to do with innovation, but it's also got to do with coming and imposing ourselves on someone's place. But we all have to be tolerant of one another in all of these places. And increasingly, it's not just the dedication to country that we hear, it's also a dedication to the virtual space. And so I'm coming to you from a place called Tathra in Australia, and you're listening from a virtual space perhaps at Rutgers University in the US or somewhere else. And it doesn't really matter where, but we're sharing this virtual place we call the internet. And so we contrast this with the artificial intelligence and it is about us understanding the world around us, which is not artificial, it's natural. It exists, I can touch this rock and I can feel a texture here. I can put my feet in the water and I can sense water around my toes, right? I'm going towards that now. And so that's real, right? That's not artificial. But if we want to sustain what's real and the natural surroundings around us, these amazing constructs, we've got to become more aware about them. And perhaps the truth is we will never actually become completely aware of the natural surroundings around us. but. We've started to name things for thousands and thousands of years. There are species that have names that are so rare and now endangered, if not extinct. But what about our quest for knowing? And knowing more about ourselves, knowing more about where we've landed, what are we doing here? And will artificial intelligence help us? Now, I don't really wanna hype AI for something more than it actually is. In many ways, it is a hype term, just like big data and um, automation perhaps, and the fourth industrial revolution that promises us to have a better life and to reach our sustainable development goals as defined by the United Nations. But the truth is we can become more aware of the around surroundings and private and public interests have started to do that. They've started to take photographs, they've logged these things, they've tagged them. In fact, in the future, this rock right here might actually have an IP address. Now, as strange as that might seem, what does that mean? How can we reclaim the internet to be for the people, with the people, by the people? And so, right now, there are private interests that are trying to figure out every inch of the earth. Uh, there have been many projects that have been about the 10,000 miles or the million miles that we should walk. And where there's no roadway, we, perhaps we can walk onto the beach and start tagging things on the beach, start taking continuous streams of photography using wearable devices, whatever that might be. But the whole point here is, is this gonna really help us? Is knowing more about these things around us and the other things that we've built up, like that surf club at the back, is knowing everything about nature, about built up areas, about where we should perhaps develop things, about where we best leave things alone. 
is that going to be best served knowing everything? And the truth is we will never know everything. We can't. It's not humanly possible. You know, as we say that we've defined every inch of the earth and we've gone where, you know, no man should go or no human should go, then what? What are we trying to achieve by knowing about everything that exists both physically and virtually? And so this is what I really want to think about when we talk about critical AI. Okay, I can take a photograph of every single animal that exists today, but new things will come into the world. We are dynamic as living beings, whether we're animals, humans or otherwise. And the other thing is, from which angle, which kind of value sensitive approach are we using? Are we for the fish in the sea? Are we for the human species? Are we for the atmosphere? Are we for colonizing other planets like we colonize parts of the world? What are we about? What is our values? And because our values are so varied, there's a complexity just in that. Okay, so I'll leave you with that point for now and just start to ask you why. Why do we have to cover every inch of the world, photograph everything, name everything? Why? Is that going to help us somehow know more about ourselves? and know where to next, whatever that next is within that, whatever that time frame is. So we've been talking a lot about artificial intelligence, but let's give a precise definition. What is this thing called artificial intelligence? And of course it's about using data sets to train algorithms to determine some kind of identity and it could be the identification of a living thing like a person or an animal or a non-living thing so there's a detection process based on a data set but then there are also these emergent artificial intelligence either based on neural networks or some kind of reinforcement learning or deep learning that occurs and this is when there's no prescribed set of code so to speak that determines something based on a training data set but we're trying to somehow achieve general intelligence whereby we're interacting getting feedback as a machine entity and learning from that feedback loop and that's pretty much how our brains work as human beings. You know, we interact with the environment around us and I know that that's water, that's actually the ocean and I can't drink it. But how do I know that? How does my brain know that? And so that's what we're trying to replicate with artificial intelligence when we're looking at things like reinforcement learning. Beyond traditional machine learning techniques that are based on data sets that have a dark side, that can discriminate, that can perhaps offer high paying jobs and advertise them only to males instead of females of a particular age group and demographic. Uh, perhaps we're discriminating against um, people with a particular uh, skin color because the database either has underrepresented groups of that skin tone or otherwise. It all depends on how the artificial intelligence is working, but big data certainly has a lot to do with that. And instead of using positive um, elements of uh, artificial intelligence, what we're doing is creating something called algorithmic bias. And algorithmic bias is when the data sets is discriminating against perhaps particular minority groups based on gender, race, ethnicity, and other socioeconomic factors, whatever they are. And so we look at this idea of AI fairness and we look at this idea of AI safety and then human in the loop for autonomous systems that are driven by AI and there's a, a lot of concepts I know in a short space of time but it's a summary of what I want you to start thinking about and so in this series of talks very short talks that I've provided you I want you to think about this context okay what constitutes artificial intelligence what is it and what computing and machinery goes into that. That's also important that you understand how the technology works, not just the buzz terms.
Now, I'd advocate that the most critical thing that one can do when deploying artificial intelligence is to figure out whether there is any evidence actually that the artificial intelligence application works, that it does what it's supposed to do, because most technology, and I say most, doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's either wrongly applied to a wrong service, there's a mismatch in terms of expectations, and there's unfortunately consumer perception that data is being collected. Now you can either look at studies that determine this, and it's not so much whether we should be trusting AI, but whether there is any evidence to suggest that what we're applying the AI to actually works. So it's no surprise to me when people say, but I don't trust the AI because there's no underlying evidence saying that the prediction, for example, for you know, looking at someone's face and determining criminality is actually accurate. We've got researchers like Kevin uh, Boyer of Notre Dame University demonstrating that that's untrue. You know, there is no 80% likelihood that my face matches a criminal profile when I'm born. I mean, that's ridiculous. And so if we think that emerging technologies are going to give us the edge in law enforcement, I think we're going down the wrong track. So no wonder people don't trust AI when there is no underlying evidence that for some applications, there is no validity in our use. I mean, in Nanjing a couple of years ago, uh, there was this hype that uh, law enforcement officers would be wearing wearable devices that could look into a crowd look for a particular hit that is a match on a single profile and all of a sudden determine the suspect in the crowd. I mean, that's as much hocus pocus uh, as I can, you know, suggest. Because you might get eight innocent suspects emerging from a crowd of people based on an image where you're trying to do a match. And it's always a fuzzy match with a degree of confidence that has an error rate that's too great. So if that's where we think we're going in the, in the future, we're going to be let down a lot. And so will a lot of people. And just like the DNA Innocence Project is still going on, when innocent people were put behind bars because their DNA was said to be matching a sample at a scene of a crime, that's what we're actually going to have going on if we trust these systems and keep going forward when there is yet evidence to suggest that this is the way to actually do it. So critical AI, yeah, you can say I'm a bit critical of AI. So here I am at Cambula Beach at Ben Boyd National Park, about five and a bit hours from Sydney. And I'm still thinking critical AI. Uh, recently, I completed a paper with Sharia Akta and others, and we were thinking about what brings out the dark side in AI. And of course, we all know technology is not neutral. Okay, whoever says it's neutral is probably not understanding technology in its guts, in its essence. But on the other extreme, people say that technology was built with inherent values. That's technological determinism. But if I just look at a, a piece of technology on its own, a piece of software not connected to the internet, not connected interoperably to anything else, well, maybe we could say it's harmless. It's not actually even doing anything. But the minute we put it into some kind of system, a socio-technical system, where there's bi-directional feedback loops between machines and people and uh, other processes, then it's doing something. And if we want to look at AI critically, one of the issues is that the people that develop the technologies, the people that develop the systems, the people that are in charge of the consulting and the rollout actually haven't come very much uh, into contact with users. And so before we even think about trusting AI, the big thing is are the people who are in charge of the development 
the analysis, the needs identification, thinking context. Are they thinking users? Are they thinking where are, where is this system going to be deployed? How many people is it going to affect? What are some of the risks? How can we circumvent those risks and mitigate them? But if there's no direct contact with users, the system is destined to fail. And when we look at statistics, like 70% of large-scale IT implementations fail, that's because the user was never consulted, okay? So let's start on that premise. The dark side of AI comes out when there has been no user consultation, when there's been no piloting, there's been no sentiment analysis over its acceptance and adoption, when we haven't looked at the perceived uh, risks or the perceived attitudes or beliefs by users, we haven't even looked at who, where do the users live? And so one of the classic rollout issues with one of Australia's biggest implementations of AI, dubbed RoboDebt, was part of the Australian tax office that was there to catch people and bring them into justice if they did fraudulent claims. Now the Centrelink agency that was in charge of this, you know, debt recovery based on fraudulent claims that were identified was working perfectly. It was a process. Uh, there were cross checks for data matching and people were investigated based on this data matching and then they were told, okay, you need to pay the government back $20,000. You know, you made a fraudulent claim, here's the evidence. But the robo debt system was not piloted extensively. The developers didn't know exactly how it would work and would you believe 470,000 letters for debt collection were sent to homes across Australia, citizens, and told, now pay up. Now the travesty of this is that many of these people were already in financial hardship, were relying on handouts from the government for their survival and their well-being, had not cheated the system, not even attempted to, and yet these 470,000 letters were allowed to be sent and mailed at different times over a period of 12 months to households. How dare they? Now the question is whether this was actually a public interest technology to begin with, or in actual fact, it was someone seeking to see whether this emerging technology would work, but it certainly wasn't in the public interest of the Australian people, of whom there are only 25 million. So when 470,000, about half a million out of 25 million are approached to pay back, there's a, there's a big issue. And so do you trust AI? If you've been one of those 470,000 people, do you trust AI if you're one of those 25 million citizens in Australia? The answer is no. Then it follows, do you trust the government? Perhaps not. So there's this ripple effect and what we've got to do is actually become better designers, become better consultants, ask the right questions, know what the code is doing, cross-check, for goodness sake, cross-check before you send out this mail, this mail to half a million people in Australia. And so AI does have a long way to go in customer management and we have a lot of recovery to do for that distrust and mistrust that now exists. So when we have this total visibility, we have something called uberveillance, a term that was discovered by M.G. Michael in 2006. And uberveillance has to do with identity, location, and condition. And if we have these three elements, we not only can describe everything around us, we can locate everything around us, perhaps using an IP address in the future, but we know what condition it's in. And most people would say in the engineering domain that are advocates of artificial intelligence, then, then we can infer and we can predict absolutely everything using both historical data and additional big data that we have at our fingertips. It's about bringing together the structured data, the unstructured data, 
to tell us about the present and perhaps even to predict the future. Now, if that sounds a little bit minority reportish to you, that's because it is. And so our job as people who critique artificial intelligence from the social sciences or the humanities or beyond in these interdisciplinary areas is to ask the big questions that are going to get the people talking about what we're doing and whether we're stuck in this techno utopian distraction of more 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 this treadmill of production as has been known in the literature or we're actually going to do something that's going to count to future generations and the choice is ours really which way are we going to go? Now, when we talk about the future of emerging technologies, of which artificial intelligence is supposed to be that which we're seeking in artificial general intelligence, supposedly anyway, we need to think about our future and what we want is we want light, right? Our future has to be filled with light and opportunity and hope. And it mustn't be filled with darkness, doom and gloom and clouds and darkness. And so we want light, right? We want clarity. So in looking to the future, the question is whether we can design our future for a better future to have more of that which I see in the back and less of that. That's what everybody wants. No matter what color skin you have, no matter what gender you are, no matter which country you were born in, no matter your age, everyone wants pure white hope. No clouds, no darkness, they want sunshine. And so I leave with you with that thought how can we introduce technologies of hope rather than technologies of doom and gloom and the way to do that of course is to imagine beautiful things and to bring people who believe in that vision that you have right so that they can be more productive and more hopeful in what we are calling public interest technology I'm Katina Michael, I'm from Arizona State University, and that's a little bit on critical AI.